create. Not for the money, not for the fame, not for the recognition, but for the pure joy of creating something and sharing it. Ernest Barbaric. Where's that hecking on button? Ooh, I found it! Let's play! Good evening everybody, Loke here with another episode of Curiosity Killed the Bat, where we interview creatives in the furry fandom. This week we have a fluffy who actually made the Loki you see before you, and they go by many names, Molly Collie, Medesai, Edward Hamstar, welcome! Hi everyone! Hello! So yeah, um, <laughs> you are actually the artist that designed the Loki that that we see in the videos, weren't you? So Yeah, uh, so I mean they were going to just be... Confuzzle badges yeah. originally, and then um, they were too adorable. Kind of sprung it on me that they were being done like yeah. that, and then now I see it all the time. <laughs> yes, uh, they, they were just so adorable. I'm like, I must use them. <laughs> so good. I'm really, I'm really glad you like them. <laughs> Thank you. But you you created them, and it's just like, ah, oh, so good. And Luke absolutely loved the little like uh, pink foxy that he's got as well. Yeah. So, oh, so I'm really pleased. <laughs> Thank you. But yeah, um, you're a first user an artist who's who raises money for charity. Cancer Research UK and other charities. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to take the opportunity to essentially talk to you about some of your work, some of your hobbies and interests in the fandom, and essentially what you do with your fursuiting. Yeah, yeah. sounds good to me. But, um, first off, so you've got quite a few different sonas. Um, some might be more aware of you as Edward Hamstar, but you've also got Molly Collie and Medesai. So I figured I'd uh, Ask firstly, could you tell us a little bit about each one, who they are, and what makes them tick? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I, I'm ancient, as people know, um, and I've been in the fandom for about 14, coming on 15 years. Um, and my original character was Medesai, although for the first few years she was actually a dragon. Okay. Um, and eventually she became a wolf when, um, like most young teenagers, I became obsessed with wolves. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but I mean, that did lead on to me actually getting to work with wolves during my college and university years. Oh, so awesome. um, you know, it, it, it did go somewhere, which uh, was good. Uh, so yeah, I've had better say the longest. Um, yeah. And uh, she's probably who a lot of my older friends would probably know me by. Um, you know, people I've known for a good 10 plus years. Yeah. Um, and she's just, uh, you know, your, 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 your bog standard for Sona. She just represents me uh, as a person, uh, but 20% cooler. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then at the start of university, I made Edward Hamster. Um, I actually got my first hamster then, and I'd been kind of contemplating having a, a small critter um, and something male to um, represent parts of me that um, just weren't being reflected with with uh -huh. Medesai. Uh -huh. um, and so I ended up making Edward, who was originally designed on my first hamster and then had quite a makeover before I got the fursuit uh, because I didn't want to be mistaken for a rat. Yeah. Um, and then actually Molly was a, a really happy accident. Uh, a couple of friends of mine who run uh, Geeky Clean, okay. uh, amazing products by the way, uh, they were selling her as a fursuit and they didn't want very much money for her. Um, I was going to help them uh, share the information around and you know get it spread for them and they gave me her dimensions and lo and behold it was going to be an exact fit for me yeah, so perfect. i said well you know don't don't bother advertising here's my credit card yeah um, take my money <laughs> yeah I, yeah um it was quite a literal representation of fry you know holding out yeah. money quite vigorously <laughs> um so i bought her originally just to to muck about in but i really sort of fell in love with the character and being a a floppy dog and uh, eventually she just became another character with with my other two yeah sweet so so you would say medesai is most representative of yourself and then the others are characterizations is, is that that's what i'm getting from that uh, yeah somewhat i mean ed uh, to a degree represents aspects about myself that i i can't um, by myself, yeah. um, I I do consider myself gender fluid, uh -huh. um, but yeah, he he is more of a character. Um, there's bits about him that you know aren't exactly the same as me. Whereas, yeah, Medesai is just you know me, okay, as I am. And would you say that like um, as characters, do they have like particular interests as well, which you portray during your sort of like suiting, or like to to sort of like develop the experience or yeah, I would say so a little bit. Um, I mean, Medesai, because 
uh, she as a character is just me. Uh, when I suit as her, she's what I would consider my, my lazy suit. I don't really do an awful lot of acting in her or anything much um, short of posing for photos, you know. Yeah. Um, whereas in Ed, he's quite bouncy. He's, I mean, he's a rodent, so he's, you know, quite squeaky. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think people have come to expect a level of um, interaction with him. Uh whether that's just poking his big thighs through to, you know, getting him to bounce up and down and be quite hyper. Yeah. Um, and then Molly is is somewhere between the two. She is kind of energetic enough, uh, you know, as you would expect from a border collie, um, without being uh, too, you know, too difficult to maintain. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, there is a bit more sort of going on with that. She's, you know, she's a, a young, sort of excitable dog, and <laughs> and I like to live up to that. Awesome, but like, so <laughs> that that excitability, would you say that's quite instrumental in uh, helping your fundraising uh, activities out? Not necessarily outside the fandom, but both inside and outside the fandom. Yeah, I, I mean, I would say so. Um, you know, especially when you're first suiting, there's a a level of performance involved um, especially when it comes to things like charity collecting or when you're going to be around the public and, and yeah. children quite specifically um, and you know you could stand around holding a bucket that's fine but that's not going to attract the attention of people quite so much as no. if you look like you're having fun yeah um, yeah I, I can so, understand that yeah yeah so there's there is a level of um, applying those character traits to um, giving an outward appearance of having fun and attracting attention. Okay, and um, so I saw saw a couple of uh, news sort of like reports about um, fur suiting, not just by yourself but with other furs as well for Cancer Research UK. Was it? Um, um, yeah. Like so uh, we're going to be doing a. An event in um, Aylesbury, which is near London. Uh, it's for Wear It Pink, so it's for um, breast cancer research. Yeah. And yes, um, the charity themselves is um, Cancer Research UK. Um, it's a big open day along the street in the town. Um, so it's not just the fursuiters. There are uh, stalls, there's musicians, there's people selling cakes, there's all kinds of stuff. Um, and we go down there um, and we carry a load of buckets around. Yeah. Um, and less than the cancer research shop that's actually on the street is allowing us to use their upper floor for, uh, you know, keeping cool and deheading and space to get changed, which is fantastic. Um, uh, yeah, last year we raised well over two thousand pounds over the course of about five hours. That's amazing. Um, and it's it's it was a really good day last year, and we're hoping for another really good day this year. I'd encourage people to come down and see what's going on, not just you know to see the suitors, but yeah. you know come and see us anyway. Yeah. Um, but to just come and check it out and throw away some pennies into a bucket. Yeah, I can put the um, a link to that uh, those details in the description below. So yeah, definitely check that out if if, if you are around Aylesbury on on that time or date. I uh, I mean, all the details will be below. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just, yes, <laughs> a little bit flappy at the moment. So, ah, yep. Um, <laughs> so a little bit squeaky as well. A bat's got a squeak, you know. Yeah, I'm just gonna totally get it. Set that out. <laughs> and yeah, I I just seem to have a uh, lost all of my notes. So we're gonna have to freestyle this. Amazing. Whoops. Cool. Yeah. So um, essentially, uh, so you you talk about uh fur suiting in in public. Would you say that um? because you are interacting with individuals that may not necessarily be used to suitors, that you do have to improvise somewhat? Yeah, uh, so, I mean, at, at every given point, there's always got to be consideration for, um, A, people who don't understand the value of a fursuit and, and, you know, not being rough with them or things like that, through to uh, respecting adults and children who may just not like them you know children will be quite outward about that by bursting into tears and being very loud um <laughs> but adults who don't like it can go from sort of avoiding you through to getting quite rough with you yeah. um and so yeah there's you know there's a level of just 
bearing in mind that it's not going to be for everybody. Not everybody wants you jumping around in front of their face and, and not everybody wants you to really go near them. And so you, you keep an eye out for key behaviors and you let people come up to you. Um, yeah. And just, yeah, it's just about having a, a bit of a respect for the people around you. Okay, so with that sort of like um, understanding and with a bit more experience than uh, than some in uh, the first shooting environment, what one piece of advice would you give to a first shooter ju just starting out, maybe going to their first meet, going to their first con? Um, I mean, so the I mean the the key bit of advice I would give someone new to it is to take it easy. Um, you know, there's there's the excitement of having your first suit and you want to get out there and you want to jump about and you want to you want to get stuck in but when you're not used to the heat and the way yeah. it makes your body react you can overheat very quickly and that's when things get dangerous and so my my advice is don't don't push it if you have been in your suit for 20 minutes and actually you're sweating buckets and yeah. you're ready to stop just stop take it off clean up have some water and the next time you do it, maybe you'll be able to double your time, 40 minutes, you know, then an hour. And then, you know, over time, you'll get used to that. So, yeah, just take it easy. Don't push it. Um, otherwise, you won't enjoy it because you'll hurt yourself. Yeah. And what's the point in doing that sort of thing if you're not having fun and those around you aren't, aren't having fun, I suppose? That's that, it. That, yeah. It, it's something to, to consider because at the end of, of the day, although we do like to develop characters and bring characters which are fun and amazing, you need to put your health first as well, I suppose. So. Yeah, I mean, you know, they, they say, you know, the health before the magic, and it's yeah, completely yeah. true. You you really do have to put yourself first in every situation, really. Yeah. So you mentioned that you've been in the fandom for quite a while, te uh, 10 years, I, I believe you said, was it? Uh, 14 S years. Something like that, 14 years. So you you must have seen quite a bit of change in the fandom since 2004 if my maths is right um yeah how, yeah. how, how would you say that the fandom has changed o over that period uh i mean my my involvement with the fandom for the first maybe seven years was heavily online obviously i was much younger yeah back then um i think the, the fandom is growing exponentially um we're getting a lot of younger people joining um and that's good you know we we need these people to be joining to keep this fresh and, and new um and i think over time you know the fandom as it gets bigger is going to run into quite a lot more discourse you're going to have more people that don't get on you're going to have more um clashes and this is where we're starting to get things like politics being dragged into the fandom yes. quite a bit and i don't actually think that's a bad thing um i think actually if anything discussing serious matters like politics and um you know all kinds of things is is quite important for for human beings as a whole and i think what that shows is that we are getting bigger we are um you know becoming more mainstream if you will yeah, and so I think yeah. uh, as as we go on, there's going to have to be um, a level of, um, you know, being a, a normal adult outside of the fandom that gets pulled into it as well. Mm. So would you say that because with like, especially in, in recent months with um, political discourse being the way that it has been, um, things have become a, a lot more controversial. They've become much more of a... Uh, a left and right dichotomy so how how would you say that political discourse should be handled in the fandom when we do have extremism at both ends and we've got the majority of furs stuck in the middle uh, i mean it's always a very difficult subject in in and out of the fandom this discourse exists and um you know i i i would very much agree to not tolerate intolerance because mm. Um, that's that's how things get ruined quite honestly um, but I think you know for the people stuck in the middle who don't really want to be involved in that sort of discourse and they just want to enjoy the fandom for what it is I'd say it's not impossible to do that I think you know you can block out quite a lot of that and just not get involved in it and similarly if you are involved in it and that's something that's important to you which you know I, I think it is to me um, you know there's a just a level of being civil about things going about things the right way um whilst like i say not tolerating intolerance really of course yeah B because a lot of people seem to take politics with a lot of levity 
and and but but have those radical views behind sort of like humor which, which can be a, a bit jarring for those that aren't used to political discussion i suppose how, yeah, yeah i mean i could agree to that yeah absolutely yeah and, and at the end of the day politics in and out of the fandom is not for everybody um and as long as we don't force everybody to join in who may not want to and and we don't force people to not have an opinion if they want to um i think you know it's just one of these things that's going to become more and more sort of rife within the fandom as we get bigger because real situations are going to start working their way into the fandom Definitely. which they have done would you say um then that with furry being the way that it is furry is analogous with drama and therefore it was eventual for this to sort of like creep in and happen because we are all humans we're all slowly growing in the world around us which is getting more chaotic um so would you say that with furries being the drama <laughs> that we are at times really amplify that side of things um so i think it's not that we've seen a huge influx in it it's simply that we've had a lot more access to things like social media that we didn't used to have back in um you know even when i became a furry Twitter wasn't a thing. Facebook was barely a thing. Uh, I think we had MySpace uh, and Bebo. Yes. Um, and uh, MSN Messenger as well, I think. And MSN Messenger, yeah. Those were the good old days. <laughs> um, and, you know, I think it's not that these things weren't there. I think it's just that we didn't have the platforms that we do now to amplify them. Yes. Um, and as a result, we, we think there's been this huge increase in this and, and huge increases in that. And actually it's just that we've given people a platform they didn't have before. Yeah. Um, I think fairies are not specifically more dramatic than anyone else. At the end of the day, we're actually just all people. And we, we like to go, ha ha furries and drama. We're, we're pretty good at drama, but you know, the reality is anyone in a fandom is probably pretty good at drama anybody outside of a fandom has probably come across drama whether it's at work or in their families or amongst friends um and we kind of we're just very good at airing it on these social media platforms yeah. um especially with the development of twitter being sort of like the the echo chamber that it can be um due to the the retweet system and the uh modernized like system essentially acting like a retweet at times like yeah. You see, you and, see a uh, lot of the same thing, but at times when you do get the controversial stuff coming in, it it it, it can flood, flood a timeline, which yeah, I, I find absolutely. Fascinating. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's both simultaneously a really good thing, and maybe not such a great thing. Um, you know, I think we're as a species, full stop, more informed now, um, and we have ways to get informed about things. And so I think it's just fascinating to see that furry as a whole has gone from this sort of quiet, uh, you know, thing about liking cartoon animals to a, a full collective of people who are human beings who have real life issues and real opinions going on. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's, it can be separated from your love of cartoon animals if that's what you want to do. Um, and I think that's absolutely fine. Um, but, it, it fascinates me that we're at a point now where we're just this big group of people um, who get to know each other over this love of cartoon animals, but we're knowing each other as people now yeah. um, and not just, uh, you know, Ted who likes Bugs Bunny, yeah. you know? Yeah, because although we do have a lot of that negativity, I think a lot of people forget that this fandom has brought a lot of people together. Um, I, for one, certainly like got to know my partner Luke a lot better through the fandom, and I'm I'm sure that numerous others have also met their their significant others within the fandom as well, and, and made massive friend groups. Would you say that like you've met a lot of your friends through the fandom, or would you say that um, that the networking side of, of the fandom has also increased over the past fourteen years? Yeah, um, so a number of my partners I met through the fandom and the man I'm getting married to I met on oh. Pounced, um, of all places. <laughs> yes. uh, you know, 
it's an incredible way of getting to know people and I would say a good 99% of my best friends over the last 10 years are furries um, it's how I've got to meet people and without it I certainly wouldn't have a group of friends that helped me run a telegram chat from Germany, Italy, two places in America, two places in the UK, you know, would never have met these people. And now I can't imagine my life without them. Yeah. So yeah, it's, you know, it's an absolutely fa fantastic way of, of getting to know people that you may never have come across without it. Yeah, it's it, it's just great. Like, it always amazes me, <laughs> like, just going off on a bit of a ramble, but it always amazes me <laughs> how much that the fandom even in like i dropped out of the fandom for two years and then i came back and it, it was so different it, it, it had changed so much in so little time so i can't even begin to really comprehend how different it must have been 14 years, years ago how small it must have been because a lot yeah. a lot has changed even even in, in those two years so would you say that like uh, small meats have also increased in, in in popularity to the extent where to take one example salt and furs it's increased from a small group to almost con levels during the summer party would you say that that is a trend that is happening elsewhere as well yeah i mean absolutely uh, about seven years ago i started attending my first meets properly um and that was when i was living back up in york okay so my my first meet was a york meet and back then, the the northern UK meets were on a rotation system. So you had York one month, then you would have Leeds the next, um, and then you'd have, say, Manchester. I think it was Birmingham, Sheffield, and um, I forget, to be perfectly honest. It, there were six of them. Um, and so you had one a month, and it would swap between them. So we've gone from just in seven years, and these were going before I was, you know, I was attending them for a fair few years. But, um, you know, we've gone from one meet in one place, you know, once a month up, up north on a rotation to each one of those places has a meet a month, um, if not more. And we're at the point where we, we can actually have enough people to attend meets in every single one of those places every month for them to be viable. So, you know, that's that's a really short space of time to go from just, you know, enough people to go to one place once a month to every single one of them every month. Um, and I, I started running the York Mini Meets. Um, well, we, we called them Mini Meets. They were just the monthly ones I was doing that were yeah. smaller than the large ones, Firefox runs. Um, and that was back in 2012, I think, or okay. 13. I uh, did those for a couple of years and then I, I ended up moving. And yeah, we've we've gone from, I think I used to attend meets for about twenty people, to like you say, Sutton Furs now. When you go, there's you know there's a good eighty odd people if you're if you're on a good day. Yeah. Um, the it, London Fur meets are every three probably. weeks, and they can get up to about one hundred and fifty people, and that's mm. just mental. Um, and I think that's a really good thing. It's obviously you know grown and reached more people, and it's given these people that chance to socialise that. I've had from online. Yeah, sweet. But yeah, like going through that vein of socialization. So although we have increased in both number and popularity as a fandom, um, and had more platforms to sort of like e express the the interest, we have also had platforms which have slowly sort of like withered and and di disappeared. Um. Are you aware of, uh, I, I suppose you're aware of, of UK fur with it being, uh, having declined in recent years um, from its popularity from about five five years ago? Have you noticed anything like that or where, where, yeah, where platforms have really withered to the extent where it's just a small group maintaining it? Yeah, uh, I mean the UK fur boards used to be the hive of where we organised our fur meets. Um, and we posted convention meetup plans and all kinds of stuff on there. And with the use of things like Twitter and Telegram, um, I, I think it's become reasonably redundant because you can get more instant replies on something like a Telegram channel than, um, you know, on a forum where if you, you leave a response to someone, you then have to let that upload and then you have to wait for a reply and then you have to reply to that. And it's not instant. Yeah. And so, yeah, if you were to log on to the UK Fur Balls now, which I do, I do occasionally do. Same. <laughs> um, 
it's yeah it's very quiet there's yes. very rarely anybody making any kind of contribution to it anymore which is you know we've gone from a site where you could buy merchandise i've got a uk fair t-shirt somewhere um to you know it's just been replaced by more modern faster things yeah um so yeah there's there's probably a fair few websites that have suffered the same sort of deal i'm i'm Obviously, I can't think of too many off the top of my yeah. head, but I'm sure there's plenty. It's, it's, um, I suppose it's like how MySpace was superseded by Facebook because it just did what MySpace did, but better. Yeah, in, absolutely. In a way. Um, and, you know, much like Discord's kind of replaced Skype and Telegram's replaced almost everything. <laughs> um, yeah, things come along and we migrate to places where we can get more people, faster response times, and, a, you know, a more genuine interaction out of people. So, you saying that like um, us us flocking to sites where we are able to get faster r response times and, and more connections, I, I find that interesting because even though we do have that, um, I feel that we've also somewhat lost connectivity, even though we've had that wider globalization. Um, would you say although we do have more connections? And sort of like uh, availability for networking, that it can be di more difficult to make friends in the fandom, or, or would you disagree with that? Um, I think, I think we've got more options available to us now. So, for example, if I um, I want to meet some furries who are super into Steven Universe, I guarantee you that Telegram or Twitter or you know somewhere has a group specifically for furries into Steven Universe mm. or, you know, similar furries into collecting model trains or furries who are super into cars, motor furs. You know, yeah. there's a few groups go in for motor furs. Um, and I think that that enables us to narrow down what we're looking for in people to talk to. Um, and in a way, I think that helps. Um, but at the same time, I think it also aids us having more discourse. Um, you know, you when you've got that available to you 24 seven and you can just get instant replies out of people, you're also going to get more friction. Okay. Um, you know, on a forum, someone might have to think up their response, write out their response, post that. And then, you know, by the time that's happened, you've had a 10 minutes to calm down and think about something. Whereas on telegram, if someone's being a bit of a pain in the butt, I can just instantly reply to that and actually like, why are you being a pain in the butt sort of, sort of thing. yeah well, why are you being a pain in the butt yeah. um and that might help or that might actually be worse because maybe if i'd taken five minutes i'd have gone okay actually um maybe they're just doing this or thinking about this which is why i i try to take five minutes to reply to people if, if yeah. they are being a pain in the butt <laughs> um so i think you know finding friends in the fandom is as easy as you want to make it. I think we've gone from a, a very internet-based culture to um, a, a very reality-based one, meets and cons and um, all kinds of stuff. And I think if you if you want to make friends, you can go do that. Yeah. Um, but it, it really depends on kind of what you want to get out of it or what kind of people you want to talk to. Um, because you're just as likely now to find people that you don't get on with, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does make sense. Thank you. Um, but I suppose as the interview does draw to a close, I've got one main question, which I ask everybody that comes on Curiosity Killed the Bat, and that is, um, you've contributed to the fandom possibly in your own unique way. However, furries both has both the good and bad, as every culture does, with it being a microcosm of the wider world. So I guess my question is, what do you personally think the future holds for the furry fandom? Um, so, yeah, I think it's going to keep getting bigger. I think we're becoming generally more accepted. Um, it's becoming less cool to hate on furries, and that's, you know, I think partly due to us cleaning up our act and, um, and just partly due to us not putting up with people unnecessarily being rude about furries and i think you know as as we keep growing and we keep finding more and more ways to to do things and to meet up and make friends i think it's just going to get bigger and better to be perfectly honest awesome Th again th thank you so much for coming on to do this interview um i always love to talk to creatives in, in the fandom and i believe you're the first fursuit we've had 
on the oh, um like well, there you go. But first dedicated first feature as well so that's awesome I, I love having <laughs> lots of different people and I just find it interesting to see different viewpoints especially from someone who has spent a little bit more time in the fandom as well so thank you Oh, thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Um, but unfortunately, it does come to that shill, shill, shill bit of the video. Um, if you did enjoy this video, leave a like, comment, and subscribe. If not, that's perfectly fine as well. Those sorts of things can be left behind, sadly, like UK Furs is. I, I don't like that. I met quite a lot of people on UK Furs. That's sad. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but um, yes, thank you once again for watching our videos. I hope you have a wonderful evening and good night. <laughs>